Hi everyone. Um, this this particular PowerPoint focuses on a reading from last week, um, as well as adding some additional information for this week called Interlocking Systems of Oppression. This is related to the Patricia Hill Collins article um, and will also help you in terms of understanding we don't sleep around like white girls do. Um, part of the sort of key points that Patricia Hill Collins makes in this PowerPoint is that she says that uh, theories of race and theories of gender um, just don't go far enough in being able to capture the real life experiences of individuals and that we must acquire new theories. She argues that we must see the connections between all of these categories of analysis, including race, class, and gender, and understand that they work simultaneously. Um, and she says that uh, in addition, that we need taking all of these things together provides a foundation for creating social change. In other words, for being able to move forward and act on issues related to social justice. She argues that contemporary theory uses what she calls an additive model. Um, categories are seen as dichotomous, or in other words, either or. And that categorized the categories are also ranked. In other words, if you're looking at race, class, and gender, you're often asked to think about, well, which one's more important? Um, which oppression is seen, uh, that oppression is seen as quantifiable, meaning that, so if you are a, a queer woman of color, right, that essentially, um, if you were just a person of color, you would be oppressed. If you were a woman of color, you'd be oppressed based on race and gender, that somehow that's worth more, that you're more impressed. Or if you are a uh, woman of color who also identifies as a, uh, as a um, homosexual, that you that somehow would be triply oppressed, right? Put in other ways, it looks a little bit more like this, right? That you're oppressed, more oppressed, or most oppressed based on how many categories you embody. Part of the problem with this particular model is that it assumes that you can disaggregate, disaggregate or separate out each of these oppressions and how they work. Part of what Patricia Hill Collins says is that there's no way really to parse out what particular social category means more in what particular situation. That in particular, for me as a woman of color, um, how can I separate out what it means for me to be a woman one moment um, and a person of color the next. And a lot of times we feel these tensions when we're reading about or engaged in different social movements. Uh, so for example, um, on when we did the, when the Trump administration did their march, uh, oh, sorry, when the women did their march against the Trump administration, um, there was a lot of little tensions within the groups because they felt that uh, an additive model was being used in which women of color or queer women were asked to suppress other parts of their identity um, and that the only thing that mattered was just the gender category. And so others have argued that there was a need to expand how we understand women. We needed to expand and understand um, the depth and breadth of women's experiences by looking at multiple axes of difference, race, class, gender, sexuality, etc that in order to understand, we also had understand that these categories worked simultaneously and you could not disaggregate them. And this is really at the core of what Patricia Hill Collins argued, is that she called it interlocking systems of oppression. Um, that it's important to see the relationship between race, class, and gender as parallel and interlocking systems of oppression. When we think about something interlocking, it means uh, like when you take your fingers and kind of place them together and interlock them, it means that you can't separate them, right? That this, and that that's what she's saying about these different social categories. And that these systems provide opportunities for connections between groups and to build coalitions. By not separating out these groups and understanding the depth and breadth of people's experiences, we can, uh, we can figure out what similarities we have and what we can do to move forward. In her um, arguments, right, or in her paper, she notes that there's three dimensions of oppression. There's institutional, symbolic, and individual, right? And that part of what you need to be able to do in, in your reading of this is to be able to define each of these three categories. I'm not going to do that here because it is part of the midterm that you're going to have to write. Um, in addition, she says that it's important for us to acknowledge power and privilege differentials across groups, and that we need to create coalitions 
around common causes. So those common causes can be around labor, labor movements, immigrant rights, whatever it might be, that by understanding everybody's experience, instead of trying to erase differences, that we can create stronger coalitions. And then more importantly, by learning more about each other, we can build empathy. We can begin to understand the people's experiences better and account for it in our daily lives. Now, this theory of interlocking systems of oppression um, goes hand in hand with what Evelyn O'Connell Glenn calls unequal citizenship, right? What I'd like you to do is to very quickly, you can pause, pause this, um, this, uh, this lecture, and I want you to list five rights that you believe all human beings globally are entitled to. And just write down really quickly, why should each of these rights you've listed be universal? Okay, so if you look at your list, uh, when we talk about basic rights and freedoms that all people are entitled to regardless of nationality, sex, national or ethnic origin, race, religion, language, or any other status, these are considered human rights. In other words, every human being should have them. This can include both civil and political rights, uh, like liberty or freedom of expression, as well as so, uh, social, cultural, and economic rights, which are things like rights to food, work, or education. Uh, what I invite you to do uh, is you can click on the link um, in the PDF version that I put up for you, or you can just simply look up the United Nations uh, um, document on human rights. And what this will do will give you an idea of how the United Nations put forth what they felt were rights that every human being was entitled to. Now note that this is not a binding document or a legal document. This is a statement of aspiration of what they felt we should really aspire to do for the planet. Um, but that different countries obviously are going to be in some form of violation of some of the tenets of that human rights campaign or human rights document. In order to understand rights, I think it's also important for us to understand citizenship. Um, this is a state of being vested with the rights, privileges, and duties because of one's membership to a nation state. You want to think of this as being determined by the U.S. Constitution, federal and state statutes, as well as court rulings. So if you were to look at um, your list, I would ask you, what are some examples of citizenship rights? Well, some of those may be uh, rights that we see written into our Bill of Rights. This could be freedom of speech, the right to bear arms for the purposes of militia, freedom of religion, protection from search and seizure, or trial by jury. It may also be covered by the amendments to the Bill of Rights, like the abolition of slavery, civil rights, equal protections laws, uh, the women's suffrage, repeal of prohibition, and 18-year-old suffrage. You know, in other words, 18-year-olds having the right to vote. These are examples of citizenship rights that every citizen of the United States should be entitled to. Um, however, Nakano Glenn argues that citizenship is used to draw boundaries between those included as members of a community and entitled to respect, protection, and rights, and those excluded and thus not entitled to recognition and rights. So she asked the question, are citizenship rights distributed equally across different groups of people? Well, given some of what you've read, I would say that your answer should be no. That ideally the answer should be yes, but in practice the answer is no. Um, part of what Nakano Glenn argues is that stratification exists because of what Nakano Glenn calls unequal citizenship. Unequal citizenship refers to ways in which rights, resources, and privileges are distributed unevenly across different social groups and categories. So we're going to talk a little bit later on in this uh, in this slide, uh, sorry, in the slideshow about how to apply that. So one example from the reading last week that you saw was the pay gap, right? That all that living in the United States, all U.S. citizens should have uh, be paid equally for the work that they do. Right, um, particularly if they're in the if we're controlling for the same job, same amount of education, uh, etc. But instead, what we find is that in the United States we have a severe pay gap. Oftentimes, in the news, you hear this um, discussed as seventy-eight cents to the dollar, right? Um, that women make seventy-eight cents to the dollar. So the pay gap is a difference in men's and women's median earnings, usually reported as either the earnings ratio between men and women or as an actual pay gap as defined below. So here you see the math, right, for an earnings ratio, you divide women's median earnings by men's uh, median earnings. 
Or if you want to know the pay gap, right, you do men's median earnings minus women's median earnings, and you divide it by the men's median earnings. So in 2013, the earning ratio was 78%, right, which means that women made 78% to what men made. And in 2013, the pay gap, right, which is really kind of the flip side of what you saw of the equation above, that the gap was actually 22%, that there was a 22% difference between what men and women made. Men made 22% more, right, per dollar. So this is how we get 78 cents to the dollar. But if we were going to apply um, both what Evelyn O'Connell, so Evelyn O'Connell Glenn would say that the pay gap, right, um, is an example of unequal citizenship, that women and men by right should be earning the same amount of money, right? Um, but here we see that that isn't true. But she and Patricia Hill Collins would also say that we need to look at things like race and gender simultaneously. So if you go to the reading that you had, they show the earnings ratio by race and ethnicity, both within group and by gender, right? And so what we find is for Hispanics or Latinas, right? Uh, Latinas make 90% as 90% uh, compared to what Latino men make, but they make 54% uh, of what uh, white men make. So in other words, they make 90 cents to the dollar of what uh, other Latinos make, and they make 54 cents to the dollar of what white men make. And you can kind of go through the rest of this table, right? That African American women relative to African American men make 91 cents to every dollar that an African American male makes, and that they make 64 cents compared to what um, uh, what white males make. Asian Americans make 79 cents uh, to what Asian American males make, 90, 90 cents to the dollar of what white men make. So part of what we see here are the interlocking group uh, systems of oppression at work. The ways in which race and gender work simultaneously um, on things like women and men's earnings. Now, in the pay gap, we know that people will use different arguments for why a pay gap exists. Uh, some will argue that it's based on the fact that women may, uh, women may possibly leave the workforce to give birth, right? They will also talk about it in terms of the types of jobs that women take compared to men. But what this largely ignores are the sort of different systems of oppression, like systems of sexism, that track women away from sciences at an early age. Um, if parenthood is a penalty, then we should also see a similar impact on men who become fathers. But we actually don't see that play out in the data, right? And so part of what's important to know about this, this particular graph and what they would say in terms of interlocking systems of oppression is that we have to understand the ways in which, um, ways in which both being a woman and a person of color impacts earnings. So this is how you would apply the interlocking systems of oppression as well as unequal citizenship. And this should sort of give you a, um, a good handhold on, or a good hold on sort of the core theory that's being, um, is being disseminated in um, in those in that particular article by Patricia Hill Collins, and you should be able to make sure you you're able to apply this in your discussions on your midterm.